when we looked into exactly who was born in Bethlehem and how this could all be that very God could take upon himself very real humanity. And that brings us to the most important question really is, is why? Why did Jesus have to come? Why did God even bother to take on flesh and to visit this planet? Really, why on earth did Jesus have to come to earth? Here's an experiment that you might try. You might find a young kid, really young, maybe they haven't been used to the things as they are, and sit them through a few Christmas movies, let them watch a few commercials on TV at this time of the year, and then drive them around town listening to that 24-hour Christmas radio station or stream. And then when you get them home, ask them, so child, tell me, what is Christmas about? And I wonder what they would say. Really, in all the machinery and all the marketing, all the materialism of our modern Christmas, all the traditions, all the to-do lists, just about anybody would be hard-pressed this holiday to know why Jesus came, to even know that the most amazing thing in history has happened, that God had visited his own planet, that God the Son came entering into time and space, transcend into this world and to live right here among us. So much the incarnate deity is buried beneath piles of gumdrops and gift wrap and a vague happiness, kind of a seasonally induced sentimentality. But buried even deeper than the reality that Jesus has come, that the Son of God has entered into the world, buried even deeper than that is, is why he came. For even those who do recognize this whole Christmas thing at least has something to do with the baby in a manger some thousand years ago, and something about peace on earth and goodwill to men, and something about angels singing and wise men coming and a star Even people who recognize that seem at a loss to explain or to understand why that baby was born in Bethlehem in Judea to a virgin named Mary. So how would you explain it to them? There's people all around us who don't know the why of why we're here. And it's a really wonderful thing to open up a conversation this time of year. You just ask, do you know what we're all getting on about with Christmas? Do you know what we're doing this for? And they might well answer, actually, now that you mention it, I really don't have the foggiest idea. I know it's something about getting gifts and giving gifts, and I get off work, and I get together with my family. And then with no real big-headedness and no looking down your noseness at people, You can take a moment to say, well, I'd love to tell you a few reasons about the why of Christmas. At least a few of the reasons, the wonderful reasons that God came. And then you're off and running into a conversation just like that. Well, why don't we spend our time looking into a few of those reasons ourselves. And our hope is that being filled up with the why we might walk out of here today all the more understanding our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We might all the more be worshiping Him and sharing Him all the more truly and authentically and boldly. Well, why did He come into this world? Some people have no idea when you ask them why Jesus came. And some have some other common notions that we might need to clear up Now, you don't need to go being negative like this with your friend and telling them, no, 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 that's not it, that's not it. But we can clear up some of those things this morning that it might help us all the more see the truth of Jesus' coming more brilliantly. The first is this, Jesus was not born to be a political savior. 
He didn't come his first advent to liberate us from government or tyranny or systematic issues or societal ills or economic oppression. We read Isaiah 9 where Jesus' name will be the mighty warrior. And we can understand how the Israelites were looking for God to come to liberate them from their physical oppressive enemies like Rome. But Jesus didn't come to be merely a political warrior. He didn't come to be a combatant against earthly foes. I don't know if you've seen the movie Jesus of Nazareth, but there's this scene where they have the zealots, this radical group of Israelites who want to liberate Israel from Rome with bloodshed and take it back by force. And they're gathered around the tomb of John the Baptist, and they're talking with each other, wondering if Jesus would be their next leader. And they've seen his undeniable power. They've seen his presence among people. And they're wondering if he could be the one that will help them take Israel by force. And then one of them says, what's the point, guys? Even if we kill Herod, another one will pop up and it could be even worse than this one. And indeed, Jesus wasn't coming to kill Herod. He knew that there was a more decisive victory that needed to be won. He was born a king. Indeed, he has an army that is greater than all the nations of the world combined. But he didn't come to kill infidels or to topple regimes with bloodshed or to set up an empire by force. He didn't come to lead Israel's glory to a restored regional superpower any more than he came to make America a so-called Christian nation. He came to do something much, much more. He came to vanquish a much darker enemy, to wage a more crucial war, and to bring victory in a battle that is raging actually in your heart and my heart. Well, a majority of Americans also believe that Jesus only came or primarily came to be a teacher. A recent survey said that even among evangelical church-going Christians, one-third of them say Jesus came to be our teacher and he's not God. So when you answer the question, why Jesus came, you're not only gospelizing to people out there, you're gospelizing to people in here. In John 3, there was a man that was thinking just this kind of thing. This man, Nicodemus, he came to Jesus to ask him some questions because he believed Jesus was a teacher from God, like Moses or the prophets, another one sent by God who comes to tell us what we need to do. And there are other movements around the world and in religious history like that where people believe they were given a special download from God or special information, special knowledge that they need to transmit to other people. And if the other needy humans can take that information and work it and apply it and live it, then they can get on the right path of life. But that's not what Jesus was like at all. People recognized him as rabbi, as a teacher, but they said he's not a rabbi like we've ever heard before. He doesn't just say the words of God. It's as if he speaks the words of God, as if he knows God, as if he speaks as he is God, as if he isn't just reading the scriptures, but he wrote the scriptures. Jesus is the teacher. He is the greatest teacher ever, but he didn't come just to teach. He didn't come to merely enlighten us or undo our bad thinking or get us on a certain path of knowledge. Again, he came to do something much, much more than that. Well, surely some believe Jesus came to us to be an example, to show us how to live better lives, to model godliness for us, though, In seeing him, we could then copy what he does. 
Some even go as far as say Jesus came really to give us an example of all the miracles that we can work on earth. Well, indeed, Jesus is the example, just as he is the teacher. And in coming to earth, Jesus demonstrated before human eyes pure godliness in the flesh. He lived what it means to be perfect as God is perfect. He exemplified holiness. To everyone close enough to see him, to witness, Jesus displayed a life that was full of prayer to the Father, a life of chastity, of self-control, of absolute humility and meekness. He exemplified a real spirit-led life. He showed what it means to turn the other cheek, to speak truth in love, to forgive, to suffer righteously, and to impeccably obey the Father. Really, in short, he came to precisely and perfectly and purposefully fulfill the law and to live out all of the law all of the time. He told us he didn't come to abolish God's law, but to see it through, to accomplish it, And he certainly does call us to see his example. After washing his disciples' feet, Jesus says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have done this, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. We are to forgive as Jesus. We are to love as Jesus loves us. We are to obey as Christ obeyed the Father. But did he come to primarily be an example to us? No. In fact, he came to do something much, much greater. Something that without which, actually, Jesus' example would not inspire us. It would condemn us. It wouldn't be good news. It would be awful news. It would judge us because we would be absolutely impossible to even begin to follow his example. So the Lord Emmanuel He came to be with us to be more than a political liberator, more than an inspiring teacher, more than an example. And surely some might pipe up about now and say, I know why Jesus came. He came to make our dreams come true. And surely when you look around the the landscape of the Christian church today, there's an awful lot of awful preaching that says things like that, that Jesus came into the world to bring us happiness, to achieve, help us achieve and make possible our dreams, to make us rich, that our, we would prosper as our soul prospers, that Jesus came so we would never ever get sick because by his stripes we are healed. He came to fulfill our destiny. If we have enough faith, he will give us a breakthrough. He'll give us our miracle. God, the Son's coming into the world, gets twisted into something like he came to empower us to live better lives or more centered lives or more purpose-driven lives. But that's not why he came. He didn't come to be used for our selfish ends. He's not a stepping stone to your potential. And as our refrain goes this morning, God, the Son, came for something much much more than that. Okay, well then why did he come? There's actually dozens of reasons that God came into the world. Each of these is worthy of its own message, and I encourage us to look into them in the remaining days we have before Christmas and the new year, that we all the more understand and appreciate our Savior to really know why he did come. Here's the first. He came to do the will of the Father. You find that in John 6, 38. Jesus tells us plainly, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, 
and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus came to perfectly do the Father's will, which is to keep, to save, and to resurrect believers in him. The writer of Hebrews writes to us, when Christ came into the world, he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And what we see in the Gospels is that Jesus only and ever perfectly just lives out the will of God, always fulfilling the law, always obeying, always abiding. He came into the world sent by the will of the Father. He went to the cross by the will of the Father so that we might look upon him and live eternally. The second reason he came, he came to shepherd God's people. Jesus looked at his own people, heartbroken that they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he came to be just that for them. In Micah 5, it says it like this, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock. That's all those people from the last verse that the Father has given him. And he should shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and he shall be their peace. The Gospel of John records Jesus saying that he came for this. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd came to call his sheep by name, and they know his voice. And he came to lead them, he says, into good pasture, to feed them and give them abundant life, to protect them, to nurture them. He came not just to inform our lives, but he came to direct our lives, step by step. And he says he came because the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, all the sheep like us who have gone astray. Thirdly, he came to light up the darkness. We sang that this morning. In John 12, 46, he says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. It's true that we humans are quite foolish people, but our foolishness isn't from a lack of learning. And it's very true that humans are ignorant creatures, but not ignorant in the ways of the world. We're not stupid. But we are foolish because we live in a moral darkness. Our spirits are clouded over in a spiritual darkness. We can't see our way out. We can't discern God's will. And in the darkness, up is down and down is up. And all of our ways look perfectly good to us in the darkness. But when the light of the world, Jesus came, he pierced spiritual light into our darkened minds, into our darkened souls. Later in John's gospel, Jesus says more on this. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. That's John 15, 22. He came into the world to show us who we really are, people of this world. He came to shine a light into our souls to really show us how far off we are from God and how depraved we are in sin. He came to illuminate us as the hypocrites and as the liars that we are, people who confess certain things with our mouth, but our hearts aren't anything like we pretend they are. He came in grace to actually call a spade a spade and a snake a snake and a sinner a sinner. In this way, Jesus was to bear witness to the truth. It's another reason he came. Jesus told Pilate, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. He came to shine forth the truth of who we are, to illuminate the truth of who he is and what God is like and what God desires and what anyone needs 
to become right with God. Another reason he came is he came to actually preach the gospel. Did you know that? Jesus came to preach the gospel. He came to proclaim the gospel. We can sum up his truth-telling mission in this. He came to preach the gospel. He was the great gospelizer. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Luke 4, 18 to 19. And a little further on in Luke 4, Jesus says this, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Someone asks you why Jesus came. He came to tell us good news. In Mark's gospel, we see at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, it starts this way. The time is fulfilled, Jesus says. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The gospel, or good news, is a proclamation of the reality that God has entered the world to save the world. It's a proclamation made by Jesus. It's a proclamation all about Jesus, that God really entered time and space, a factual news report. God has come to save his people. Jesus came for the gospel. He came not only to be the way of salvation, but to call us to believe in him as that way of salvation. Jesus came for the gospel to make it good news and to tell us that it is good news. The message of why Jesus came wasn't something that people needed to figure out hundreds of years later or make up about him. He told us he was sent to herald good news himself, which is what the angels announced at his birth when he came into the world, peace on earth for the God who saves has come to save you who can't save yourselves. Number five, Jesus came to bring great joy. He came to bless us with great joy. That's a word that's all around Christmas, joy. We chase it. We hope to spread it. We sing it. But really, if you want to shock somebody this season, maybe at your office, maybe around the dinner table, if you really want to blow their socks off, you tell them, do you know who in all the universe is the greatest purveyor of joy, the greatest joy aficionado, the greatest dispenser of joy? It's the Lord God himself. And your friends might shake and wonder what you're talking about because if your friends are like my friends they think the absolute opposite god is a kill joy he doesn't want me to party doesn't want me to have fun he doesn't want me to enjoy life right but satan came with that trick back in the garden did god say you can't eat from any tree god wants you guys to be miserable doesn't he But hear what the angels announced when God came into the world. Fear not, for behold, I bring you great news of great joy that will be for all the people. Jesus is our joy, and he brings us joy. Jesus came into the world to bring us eternal joy, full-up joy, overwhelming, overflowing joy. Not, Not a meager amount of joy not a moderate amount of joy, an overwhelming amount of joy, a joy that is indescribable and so good and so otherworldly, a joy that is indestructible because it comes from God and it's not dependent on our situations, joy that can't be robbed or stolen, for he came to give us himself and his life. I came, Jesus said, that people may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is in the joy-giving business, and he came to lavish joy upon us. 
You can add another reason here. Jesus came to bless us. To bless us. Not in any of that nonsense about making our wishes come true or enriching us with money, but he came to bless us as the blessing. God has always been blessing people. He's always been good to people and pouring out gifts to people, giving them marriage, giving them children, giving them life and air to breathe, giving them jobs and relationships, giving them harvest, giving them love, giving them friendships. But God also promised another major blessing. Way back in Genesis, God promised to send forth a seed of the patriarch Abraham, whom all the families would be blessed through. Do you remember that in the book of Genesis? And Peter the apostle and the friend of Jesus in Acts 3, he stands up in Solomon's portico and he announced to everybody, that seed, that blessing is none other than Jesus Christ who walked here in front of us. It is through him that all nations can be blessed to have a relationship with the Father, to be made right with God. But Jesus is the blessing. He is the greatest gift of God. And it's through him that the ultimate blessing of God comes to us, the blessing of salvation. Well, going along with that, another one you could add is that he came to fulfill the prophets. Or he came to make God's promises true. God the Son came into the world to fulfill all of the Father's will. He came into the Word to fulfill all of God's law. But he also came to fulfill all that the prophets had said would happen. Or another way of saying this, he came to make all of God's promises and words come true. He came to show how faithful God is to his people and his covenants and his word. So much of the Christmas story displays this, the virgin birth, being born in Bethlehem, being of the royal line of David, what we just said about being the seed of Abraham, and even way further back, God's promise that one day one born of a woman would come. He gave this promise to Eve and Adam and that serpent way back in the Garden of Eden, and Jesus came to fulfill that. Jesus' birth, his life, his resurrection, they all show forth God's amazing perfection and his faithfulness. God said long ago things like, Behold, the days are coming when I will fulfill the good word I have spoken. And Jesus came to do just that. God came into the world to keep his word, to keep his promises, to fulfill his covenant vows. He came because he said he would come. As it is written, so it became history. And Jesus, all the promises of the Bible find their focus, they find their center, they find their ultimate fulfillment in all he is and all that he did and is doing and will do. He came into the world to fulfill his promises to the world. Well, number seven, he came to destroy the devil. Someone asked you why Jesus came, that's what he says. Back to that serpent and those promises the promise that God made way back in Genesis chapter 3, Christ came into the world to destroy the devil and his works, to crush the serpent's head. That ancient promise after mankind fell into sin is that one born of a woman would come to crush evil. And that's precisely why God came. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15 says this, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Jesus took on flesh that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. 
1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the devil and destroy the works of the devil. The devil is real, if you didn't know that. There's no doubt about that. He's a mighty foe. And apart from myself, he is my greatest enemy. But he is a creature. He's a fallen angel. He can't make you sin. But he does still prowl around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He prowls, but he is chained up. He has a bite, but all the poison has been taken out of his fangs by Jesus. He's been doomed really since the beginning of the Bible, but when the Christ came born in Bethlehem, the doom, the destruction of the devil became all the more real. It was the beginning of the end for Satan and his minions and his ways of rebellion against God. They're still around. They can reach out and try to grab you, but they can't condemn you. And Satan can't ultimately harm you, for Christ came to destroy his works. Someone much better than me said it in a very pithy way. If you belong to Jesus... When Satan comes to condemn you for your past, don't be scared. All you have to do is remind him of his future and your future while you're at it. For he is doomed to suffer an eternal punishment in the lake of fire and you are destined to enjoy an eternal flourishing with the Lamb of God in his kingdom. And it's all because Christ came into the world. Number eight, he came to save us or serve us. He came to serve us with his life. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know something? The one real God, he's not anything like those petty pretend gods. The glorious God doesn't need us to serve him. But actually, in all of his glory and radiance, he comes in an overflow of his greatness to actually serve his creation. That's mind-blowing. He came to serve you. Not like a genie that you rub and then you get whatever you want. He didn't come to serve you like that. Jesus is not your great cosmic ATM machine or vending machine that if you know the right code and you can push the right buttons and you you pay him off, out pops or dispenses whatever your dream is. That's not why Jesus came. That's not how he serves us. He's not our slave. But he did come to serve you with his life. He took on flesh and he offered up his divine life and his perfect human nature to serve you actually because you couldn't serve him with your life. And he continues to serve those who put their faith in him. It's true when you're a Christian, you become a servant of God, but you don't become God's little helper. He doesn't need our help to accomplish anything. And in fact, he continues to help us. He continues to help us be the exact people he designed us to be the people that he saved us into his kingdom to be. He continues to help us to live the kind of life worthy of God, glorious to God. He helps us to obey him, to walk with him, to love him. He is the king who came into the world to serve the world. And he serves us with his whole life. He's the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And Jesus was born to reveal God's glory. If you're keeping track, that's number nine. He came to reveal God to us. We heard today, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. While other people talked about God 
and God revealed his words through men and through women, the Son came to actually show us God. He told his disciples that if they had seen him, they had seen the Father. For in Jesus, all the fullness of God dwelled in flesh. Veiled for our safety, but all of God was standing there before all of men. He came to show us who God really is and what God is really like. He came to give us a face to look at the king and to shine forth glimpses of what his kingdom is like, full of mercy and love and grace and healing and fulfillment and hope. He came to show us how God treats his enemies, loves his neighbors, and saves his people. And the Son came not only as the Word or Logos in flesh, but he came to give us God's final and greatest message to this world. In the last days, the writer of Hebrews tells us, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. For it is through the Son that the Lord God most truly, most powerfully communicates with us that he has most clearly and most fully spoken to us. The word came to speak to us. And he came to greatly glorify God. He came to glorify the Father and bring ultimate glory to himself. Yes, the Son came because he deeply loves you. And he came to show us God's love and to give us divine love. But the Son loves the Father so much more than he loves us. And the ultimate joy set before Jesus wasn't really our salvation for our sake as much as our salvation to the glory of God. The Son came to glorify the Father. If you ever wonder about Jesus' motives, why is he doing this? Why did he do that? Why won't he do this? When is he going to do that? If you wonder about Jesus' motives, you can keep it simple and go back. He does all things to glorify God, to glorify himself. His main motive in life is not human-centric. Even in the gospel, it's not human-centric or we-centered. It's God-centered. It's Christ-centric. As Jesus faced death on the cross, he said this, For this purpose I have come to this hour, to his death. Father, glorify your name. It's what the angels sang at Jesus' birth. Glory to God in the highest. Why? Because the Son has come. And why has he come? that God may be glorified in the highest. In doing the will of the Father, in saving those appointed to eternal life, by dying for the sins of the world on the cross, Jesus was bringing glory to the Father. His coming into the world glorified God. His perfect life on earth glorified God. His sacrificial death glorified God. His resurrection and ascension brings glory to God. What do we mean by that? That in all that Jesus is and all that he does, he makes humans and angels eternally rejoice and remark, what kind of God is this? What kind of God lowers himself to take on flesh to come and save people like us? What kind of God is this that loves us this way? How glorious and righteous and wonderful, how mind-blowing is God? How amazing is God? Jesus brings that glory as God to God that we remark, what kind of God is this that loves people long before they ever loved him? What kind of God is this that can take a device created by the Romans for shame and torture and he can transform it into a device of salvation and honor and glory. What kind of God is this? Who is this that wouldn't only forgive his enemies, but would die for them? 
when we look upon the life and the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we glorify God. Christ came so that God's amazing grace and his perfect justice, his immeasurable mercy, his endless love, that it would all shine forth the glory of God. Now, there's so many more reasons that we don't have time to talk about. He came to be made like his people, Hebrews 2 says, so that he could perfectly intercede for us as our high priest. He came to be near us when we couldn't be near him. He said he did not come to judge, but he did come to bring judgment. John 9, for judgment I came into this world. He came to bring peace and he came to bring a sword that divides and pierces. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to give gladness instead of mourning. He came to pour out his spirit to us. He came to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. He came to make us into the temple of God. He came to give us adoption as sons and daughters of God. And as we sang this morning, Jesus came to satisfy our deepest thirst and our greatest hunger, the thirst and the hunger for God, to be right with God, to be satisfied by God. I hope you're not dizzy but I hope in kind of a good way you're a little bit reeling at the beautiful, amazing facts about why God came. But we might still ask, okay, that's fine, but why did he have to come? That's why he came, but really why did he have to come? And we have to understand the real fact of Christmas is that he didn't have to come. He didn't owe us anything. We don't deserve him coming to save us. We didn't make him come. We don't usher in his advent. The very good news is that though Jesus didn't have to come, in amazing, awesome mercy and wonderful faithfulness, he did actually come. You know, the real Christmas story is such good news. It's such shocking and beautiful news because it's true. And because it doesn't shy away from the evil in the world out there and the evil in me in here. It doesn't deny the darkness in your heart or mine. But the real Christmas story confronts us with the evil that's not only around us but is inside of us. Jesus' coming really holds a mirror up to my face His coming holds a mirror up to my soul because it answers with brutally good news that God came because I was in such a desperate need of a Savior. He came because I needed Him. He came because like we heard in the Psalms, we needed someone. We had been putting our trust in princes and presidents and professors and so-called prophets and all their promises. But as we heard from Psalm 146 today, none of them even came close to fixing the evil in the world or the evil in me. In them there was no salvation, and all of their plans perish. There is no ultimate good news. There is no gospel in the religions of men. They're all dead, and they're all killing me. They tell me, try a little harder to get on with trying to be a good boy, to maybe bow over here and clean this up over there. They encourage me to give more, more sacrifice, more money, more time, more energy, and they call me to hope in the best when I've done my best. They tell me to get wiser. They tell me to look within myself to pull myself up, to focus on myself. But in the end of following all the traditions of men and all the wisdom of these princes, at best I'm only slightly better than I used to be. And very often I'm actually far, far worse. 
If we only needed an example, Jesus could have sent an angel or an obedient servant. If we only needed enlightenment or encouragement, Jesus could have sent another prophet, maybe somebody like the Baptist who could chastise us, give us new words from God, or call us back to follow and to repent, to love the Lord with all of our souls, all of our heart, all of our lives. But that's just the problem. More words more examples, more time, more energy, more willpower, more punishment, more threat of punishment. It would never do what we needed most. It would never turn us back to God. It would never give us a new heart with which we could love the Lord. It would never give us a new mind with which we can know the Lord. It would never rebirth a desire in us to love God the Lord, and it would never, ever give us a new life with which we can be accepted by God. Those words of men and religions of men, they can't forgive us and they can't make us right with God. Why has God come? Because he looked down on his creation, living in our utter injustice and our violence towards each other. He peered into our dark hearts He looked into our dark minds and our twisted desires. He looked into our lives that are drowning in pride and idolatry, our lives wasting away in lostness and crippled in death-deserving, death-making sin. And after all of that, he came himself to do something about it. Why did God come? He came for Easter. Why was the baby born in Bethlehem? He was born to die. The great why of Jesus' coming is he came because he needed to do what no human could do, to live a perfect life that we were hopeless to live, and to deliver us from the sin that we were helpless to escape from. Why did God visit this planet? More than just to teach us a way to get to heaven or to show us a higher thought or to inspire us to be the change that we want to be or reach our potential. He came to deal with what's most crippling, most dangerous in your life. He came to deal with what has shattered the universe, what has corrupted our bodies, what's poisoned our minds what's destroyed our relationships with each other and with him, he came to save us. This is the last reason he came. He came to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul is writing to his friend and he says, why did Christ come? The saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. He didn't come to reform us. He came to redeem us. He came to set us free from sin that ensnares us and traps us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's what it means to be a sinner. Sure, sin manifests itself in all kinds of ways. We are fornicators, we are cheaters, we are hypocrites, we are abusers of people, but it's much deeper than that. It means we have ignored God. We have tried to decide our own lives and live by our own rules and make our own way. We have turned to our own selves to try to pretend that we are kings and queens of our own universe, and that's your great sin, and that's my great sin. In pride, we pretend that the real God doesn't exist. We pretend that he didn't need to come into the world. He didn't need to save me because I can figure this out by myself. Whether he's real or not, I won't worship him. I won't glorify him, not moment by moment, not with the entirety of my life. Our chief sin is that 
We know God does exist, but we won't give him our worship. We won't receive him in our hearts. The really great sin of humankind is trying to wear God's crown on our feeble, fragile little heads. And that's our great iniquity that we heard about from Isaiah. The Lord knew we needed to hear it a few times this morning. It's our chief transgression. These sins that we had, they haven't just disappointed God. They have locked us into them. That we're chained in sin and we can't liberate ourselves out of it. We can't work our way out of the penalty of sin. And that's the really awful, terrible news of Christmas, and it's the really, really good news of the gospel. God came to save you because you can't save yourselves, and no one else can do it either. What was God going to do with all your sin? The great question that Christmas answers is, how could God bring justice for sin and still love us? How could he crush all of our iniquity without crushing us? Isaiah told us, because Jesus came to take our iniquity onto himself so that he would be crushed for our sin and we wouldn't be crushed but delivered. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. You need to make Christmas personal. It's not abstract. It's not distant. It's not vague. It's not a metaphor. It's your sin for which Jesus came. It's my sin for which he came into the world. Why did Jesus have to come? Because in God's wisdom and his perfect economy of justice and righteousness, he deemed it that there was no other way for us to be saved. To pretend that there is another name to call on, to pretend there's another way to find peace in this world, to get right with the universe, to work your way to God, is to pretend that Jesus didn't need to come, but God says he did. He needed to come to take our iniquity away. That's what you need this Christmas. That's what I need this Christmas, is to recognize the Son who came to make us to be accounted righteous, by pouring out his soul to death. Jesus came because you and I so gravely needed a Savior. And the good news is he didn't call us when he came to be a little kinder or to be a little nicer or to live a little better. That's what the religions of men call us to do. But God came with just this, calling us to believe in him to believe in him, to put our trust and our faith that Jesus is the Savior we always needed. All he wants from you this Christmas and every day of your life is to receive him for who he is, to respond to the truth of who he is. What he wants from you is just this, listen to him. Receive him as your Savior. Worship him as your Savior. Obey him as your Lord and bask in the glory that is God, poured into our hearts as Christ unites himself with us forever. Well, Jesus didn't come to point us to the Christmas spirit. He really came to put his spirit within us, and not for Christmas or a season, but for eternity. He came not just to make us a little kinder, to make us a little gentler. He came to rebirth us into new creations who are forever loved by him and forever united by him. Really, you could say that Jesus came to prepare us for his second advent. And thinking about why Jesus came, we need to think one more thing before we go, why is he coming again? Just like there's many reasons he came, there's many reasons he's coming again, but here just one of them, the truth from Hebrews 9. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Dear ones, Jesus is coming again, but for those who have not put their faith and trust, 
when Jesus comes back, whether that's this afternoon or another millennia away, he's going to keep his promise and he comes back. But for those who will not put their trust in him, when he comes back, it's not a time for a second chance. There's no more time to put your trust. He came once to deal with our sins on the cross. He's not coming again to deal with them. He's coming again to judge them. And for anyone who will not put their trust in Jesus Christ, when Jesus arrives back, full of glory and majesty and power, he won't be a baby in a manger, but he will be the righteous God unveiled before our eyes. And anyone who will not put their trust in him, they will have to stand before God. And Jesus says, his word will condemn us. The word that was given to us in which we would not believe, we would not trust him. Now we will see him for who he really is. And he says, now it is the time for the judgment. That's why he's coming. But for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ, he says he is coming to complete our salvation. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ, he saves you immediately today. You are forgiven your sins, you're united with God, and then he continues this work of salvation in your soul, sanctifying you, changing you, and transforming you into the likeness of Christ. And we eagerly await his coming, because on that day when he comes back, for those who have put their trust in him, he will complete our salvation That means he will resurrect our bodies. That we will be able to stand with undefiled selves in front of the throne of God and we won't melt and we won't be crushed because Jesus has taken all of that judgment upon himself and he's counted all of his righteousness upon us and he will complete that. We won't just be counted as holy, we will be made holy in what the Bible calls glorification. So what we are to do is to eagerly await our Savior. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Let's do that this Advent. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are beyond words of thanksgiving to say thank you for sending your son and words of appreciation and praise, Jesus, for thanking you, worshiping you, that you did come when you didn't have to. Lord, help us know all the more why you came to rejoice in all the wise, to be wondering about all those wise, to be amazed at all those whys, and to live our life now in response to the reality that you have come. You have taken away our sin and united yourself with us and to eagerly await the day that you will come again. Blessed be the name of Jesus, the Savior who came to redeem us. Amen. Mm